shadowed in her description of the center by working across systems to meet the needs of our children. Indeed, I, I believe there's a different type of field building underway. It is no longer just the child welfare field, the behavioral health field, the education field, the youth development field, or the juvenile justice field. These fields are doing their work, they're viewing their work in a different way, and that is across systems. As some have framed this in the work around Reclaiming Futures, an initiative that focuses on juvenile justice and substance abuse, these individuals are boundary spanners. They, they think outside of their silos each and every day in terms of how they do their work. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What I also want to suggest is that there's a more basic lens through which we need to view our work. That what we're all trying to provide is very simple but very profound, profound and very difficult to achieve. Put simply, it is to provide love, opportunity, and hope for our children and youth. And that is what we want in our own lives. It is what we should want and strive to achieve for all of our children. To love and be loved back in a healthy way. To have opportunities, in particular opportunities for skill building and meaningful work in our lives. And to have hope for the future. Hope that life will get better. That today isn't the best that life is going to be. And for too many of our kids, in the dire circumstances they find themselves, they don't see that hope for the future. And they don't have those loving relationships and the opportunities we systemically and how we connect them to should be able to provide. It's these three things that are at the heart of what we do each and every day in working with our children, youth, and families who are in the child welfare system and who are often showing up in other systems as well. Rabbi Harold Kushner in his book, Living a Life That Matters, said, we don't have to do great things, headline-grabbing deeds to matter to the world. Everyone who puts in an honest day's work, everyone who goes out of their way to help a neighbor, everyone who makes a child laugh or healthier changes the world for the better. In the same book, he quotes Dr. Dean Ornish, our survival depends on the healing power of love, intimacy, and relationships. Marquita Argovia, the singer-songwriter of the Oscar award-winning song Falling Away from the movie Once, said in her acceptance speech, this song was written from the perspective of hope, and hope at the end of the day connects us all, no matter how different we are. That's what we do, whether it be in child welfare, whether it be in behavioral health, whether it be in education, juvenile justice, or in youth development, we provide hope and we provide these connections. I hear a lot about connections in our dialogue about our work. I interpret this to mean connections that lead to love, intimacy, and relationships. In child welfare, it's a connection to individuals who can help create permanence and well-being in a safe environment. In behavioral health it's, health, it's a connection to treatment. And in juvenile justice, it's a connection to positive pro-social influences that can help guide and provide hope, along with the connection to other supports and treatment. So I begin my presentation with these thoughts because the lessons learned in my career are that if we get these basics right, we will have a better chance of succeeding in our work to reduce child abuse and neglect. This is what you've been trying to do in your work here in Baltimore, in Maryland more broadly. But we have to go further. We need to make sure that none of our children fall through the cracks. And often, too often, that doesn't happen. I want to amplify this point with a story that actually comes from a different field, but one that makes the point, I think, in a very powerful way. There was a visiting lecturer who was speaking on, on risk management and how we go about assuming risk to a group of businessmen and businesswomen. To drive home one of his points, he asked for a volunteer from the audience to answer three hypothetical questions. First question was to imagine that he had a huge steel I-beam in front of the podium 15 feet long, six inches wide, six inches high, and offered the volunteer $25 if they would assume the risk of walking across the I-beam. The volunteer indicated, of course, there's very little risk in that. I'll assume the risk, and I'll walk across the I-beam. Hypothetical number two, assume that now I've got same I-beam, now except instead of 15, it's 30 feet long, and it's spread across a gorge, dropped down to 300 feet to a bed of rocks. I offer you now $50 to walk across the I-beam across this gorge. Volunteer indicated very quickly, no way I do that. Too much risk for $50. Third hypothetical. Now let's imagine that I'm on one side of that gorge and you're on the other. But on my side, I've got one of your children. 
and I'm holding your child by the hand over the edge of the gorge. And if you don't walk across that, that I-beam and get your child, I will drop your child into the gorge. I'll offer you $100 to walk across the I-beam. The volunteer paused for a minute and said, can I ask you a question before I answer? No problem. Which one of my kids do you have? <laughs> So uh, 